Hey, everybody, this is going to be a rather quick intro to today's episode with Kyla Scanlon, one of our favorite financial analysts on TikTok, Substack, Twitter, Spaces, basically any platform. As you all know, it's Thursday morning. I am subbing in for Crystal on Breaking Points last minute. She had a family emergency. So if you want to go check out the episodes we do there, come there afterwards. But we need to do this quick because I have to get to the train to Got get on back the train. down to DC. So look, we've hit a bunch of topics that we've been really obsessed with the past few weeks. Our episode with Christopher Mims on supply chains went gangbusters. We are talking about Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg with the metaverse. So, Sagar, why did this pretty wide-ranging conversation with Kyla make a lot of sense and hit things that this audience is going to need to know more about, even if we're not quite sure we get it yet? Kyla does a great job of uh, simplifying complex problems and explaining them that I think that explains why she's been so successful. She's so young, on even though she's on TikTok, you know, not a platform we are, but we're aware kind of of her work. So that helped us. She broke down inflation. She broke down supply chain. She broke down Web3. This is something you guys are going to hear us talk a little bit more about because you know that everybody's talking about it, but it all seems to not make any sense whatsoever. Is it a grift? NFTs? What's going on with that? A DAO? What are you, are you talking about monks in Asia? Like what's happening here? So she does a very good job of breaking that down for me personally. And I think you guys will find it very useful. Oh, look, my yeah. dog's here. Okay, go on. Hey, Thatcher, you know, and a, a good way to think about this episode is even if you don't exactly understand every single specific idea that Kyla is talking about, these are spaces that we're going to go more and more into because what we're both noticing here is that every day in the news, there's all these big new things. You wake up one day, everyone's talking about supply chains. The next day, Facebook is renaming itself Meta after something called the Metaverse. What is right. that? So I'm really excited for us to take the show. Sometimes, not always, a bit into this direction and hit all the good points here. I'll run through all of the obvious points real quick here. Number one, it is Thursday. That means that on the train back to New York, I will be writing a Substack newsletter, but I want you all to go check out, subscribe in the show notes. It's been a really great time seeing people engaging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Two, Kyla does not have a book yet, but this is still a show where we like to hawk a lot of books. So go follow the link to our bookshop. Finally, Sagar, am I missing anything? So many things to run down. Special thank you to the Lincoln Network for sponsoring this podcast. So there you go. Once again, this is going on YouTube. That is Lincoln Network, not Lincoln Project. I'll be saying this through the rest of the year. Uh, but I will say, Sagar, huge props. A friend of the show immediately commented on the last YouTube video saying, it's Lincoln Network, not Lincoln Project. So the people understand. Everyone gets it. The people huge get points it. to you. Thank you. Let's dive into this really great episode. Kyla Scanlon, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Good to see you, Kyla. Good to see you too. Any audience members, especially the younger ones, may recognize Kyla from TikTok. She is incredible there. Um, I say incredible there because neither of us actually use TikTok. So I'm basically basing this entirely off of your Twitter reputation and very nice things people say. So if any of you listeners are on TikTok, I recommend you go give Kyla a follow if that is how TikTok works. Wow, that was the most boomer out of touch thing <laughs> I've ever said on this show. But no, so uh, I want to talk with you, Kyla, because what I love about your coverage and also your YouTube channel and your sub stack that we actually do consume is you're doing a really great job of covering all these deep, important concepts that are bandied about in the discourse. So supply chains, Web3, metaverse, inflation, hyperinflation, crypto regulation going down the line that everyone is basically hearing in the public discourse on podcasts and newsletters in the news, but they're not actually going deep or getting specific on them. So let's just treat this as an episode where you help Sagar and I get a better handle on all these difficult and different topics that we're thinking about. So let's start off with the metaverse. I want to be very precise with this because I had a friend who is very anti-Facebook. He saw Mark Zuckerberg's announcement that they were changing the name to Meta, and he also said, man, this is all such a grift. 
all these people are basically creating this new fake thing just to make Mark Zuckerberg look cool. However, the truth is the metaverse is actually a deeper, longer term uh, actual topic and issue. So let's just get into that. Like, what is the metaverse? Like, what are your thoughts on it? All the good stuff there. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) I think it's really exciting what Facebook is doing, rebranding to Meta, because it shows like, I think how much potential is there, but it definitely was a very dystopian thing. If you watched the whole thing, like it was kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to be a part of that world for a lot of people. But I think the metaverse at large is just this digital physical reality. So instead of us all being on the Zoom call right now, our avatars would be in a digital conference room and it'd be much more engaging. It would be much more consistent. Um, and I think like with the biggest thing with the metaverse is there's that persistent feeling to it. So you, there isn't like the disruption of going tab to tab like we have on the internet right now. So you'd be, the whole experience would be much smoother. It'd be much more interactive. You'd be interacting with real people. So like you can think of a video game where you're like interacting with all these different people and playing a shooter game or whatever, but you would be doing that like in a boardroom or at a coffee shop. So that's kind of, it's just rethinking how we interact online. Yeah, it's interesting to me whenever I think about it. The take, the cynical take that I've seen is that what Mark really wants to do is to escape the Apple ecosystem. As in, Facebook wants to stop being reliant on Google and Apple in order for people to be able to access and use its products. And instead, they want to become the de facto operating system through which everybody interacts. Is that directionally correct? Like, what does that look like? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, Zuck did an interview with Ben Thompson and the whole thing was like he's wanted to build something like this for a long time. He's not happy that Facebook is so reliant on all these other brands and he wants to be the operating system of the metaverse. And I think that's what the whole goal is. is, And I mean, there's like all sorts of speculation. Is he running away from regulation? Is he running away from like the very bad brand that Facebook has developed? Is he running away from Apple and the all encompassing being that Apple is? Um, I think that there's probably a lot of different variables that play into that for sure. Mm-hmm. Could you speak to why people should be excited about the metaverse? Because Kyla, you know, we've done stuff at On Deck. I enjoy speaking with you. I'm not quite sure I'm looking forward to sitting in a virtual conference room with you doing this type of thing. And and obviously we're, we're content creators. So actually to a certain degree, that probably would be a bit easier to do this. But why is your normal internet consuming person who mostly interacts through mobile, they're not even probably on a desktop or a laptop. Why is that something that people are hypothetically excited about? Uh, so I don't think that many people are that excited about it. I think that, you know, we, there's sort of the pandemic energy, like we're on the, almost the other side of this big pandemic where we all were inside for a year. And so I think like that original idea was very, very appealing during that time, but there's like other applications to the metaverse with, you have like, you have education. So like kids now, how can they learn better? Because rote memorization probably isn't going to be the answer to having like a successful educational system. It's going to be, how can they actually have immersive online? education and the metaverse is an an answer to that and then i think with commerce too so like how do you shop online e-commerce so i think the metaverse could be another answer to that but in terms of like how we engage i mean the only like a couple of applications would be like for workplace you're going to potentially have less like idea to execution friction if you're operating in a virtual boardroom where everybody is like actually there Um, but i think for social engagement like there could be incrementally some benefit but i think most of the time we are still human creatures like we still have these almost animalistic needs to like be around other people and so I think that maybe that part won't take off as quickly as we think it will but then also like you have to zoom out and be like okay we we do exist on twitter.com and we engage there so this could just be twitter.com but but in the metaverse sort of thing too yeah. I wonder how people are thinking about, you know, yes, it's true. People are on Twitter, Facebook, all of that. But as you alluded to, I mean, nobody really like there is just something to doing something in person. Like there is a if anything, you know, uh, being hyper online has produced a deeper appreciation in a lot of people to kind of reject um, a lot of what we're seeing. You know, we see millennials, people like or even Zoomers most of the people want to go back to the office or they want some sort of hybrid, you know, schedule as in they want the option because that's actually where the sociability comes in is older people who actually much prefer, uh, much prefer working from home exclusively. How do you think that plays out in terms of how this metaverse actually comes to be? 
So this is something I've been thinking a lot about is sort of this return to analog. So I'm on the cusp of a Gen Z. Uh, so I just turned 24. So kind of sit there. And something interesting that's happened is Gen Z people have started to wear wired headphones. And yeah. so it's like, if they're starting to wear wired headphones. Like, why do we think that they're going to be gung ho to like go into the metaverse? Like, I think there's going to be yeah. this return to to simplicity. So I, I, I totally agree with you. It's going to be really hard to convince people like, oh, no, don't go into a physical office. Go online, go on Zoom like you were for most of your college experience because of, you know, unfortunate circumstances. Yeah. Wait, why? I've seen this, but what's the actual articulation of why Gen Z is using wired headphones? Because I will say out of all the different tech products we can joke about, I actually love AirPods. AirPods are great. They 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 are straightforward. They're very comfortable. It's actually very annoying to do things with wired analog versions there. What's actually going on there? I think there's a couple arms to it. Like, I think it's the aesthetic. So you kind of want to have like that wired aesthetic. You don't want, you want people to like know that you're listening to music. I think it's very much like a signaling tool. Um, And then I think, uh, there's a couple other theories about like why, like from from like just a nostalgia perspective, sort of having that instead of having the AirPods. So I think it's it's a couple of those things. It's just like people just want to return to a simpler time and they have nostalgia for that. And also they like the way it looks. That's so funny, given that I hated wired headphones so much. I was one of those early adopters of the very uncool ring that goes around your <laughs> neck for Bluetooth just so I could take phone calls like this. So listen, Gen Z, I'm never going back because it actually was a gigantic pain in the ass, especially while exercising. Um, one of the things I do want to get your opinion on um, here is Web3. Um, I'm hearing a lot about Web3. I know I'm supposed to care about it, but I'm going to be honest. I find most of it utterly indecipherable. Um, and I'm unable to decide whether this is being wish casted into existence by people who have a major financial interest in making this a thing, whether it's a genuinely revolutionary social movement, where should I fall on that spectrum? What do you think it is in its most basic form? And I'm speaking on behalf right now of a lot of listeners who know that it's a thing, but have no idea what the hell it is. Yeah. So it's like the this probably isn't the best example or explanation, but it's sort of like the decentralized web three. So everything that you have on sort of your web two platform, like would it be Twitter, Instagram, however, like that's sort of the decentralized version of it. So and web three, you're going to have DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations. So instead of having an LLC, you'd have a DAO where people who have tokens that represent ownership in the DAO can vote on how the organization is going to proceed. So instead of having like a bunch of people in boardrooms making decisions, it's going to be the community making decisions. Um, And then from like an ownership perspective, everything is monetizable in Web3. So you have these NFTs. So (laughs) it's crazy. Like everybody wants you to NFT every single thing that you've ever done. And that enables like a lot of cool monetization aspects. But then it's also like, how much do we need to financialize about our lives? And so everything is just sort of um, be the ownership is spread out, but it's also a way for people to collectively own things. So mm. that's kind of how you can think about it. Yeah. Kyla is someone who makes her living through explaining these narrative ideas. Can you speak to what's going on with the web three discourse? Because what's really interesting to me and we're going to hit this in the introduction to make sure this is all clear is that everything we're talking about here web two to web three, decentralized autonomous organizations, NFTs, all these different ideas feel really cool. And the direction we are very cool. But I just know that no matter what we do, this conversation is going to go over the heads of a huge percentage of our audience. And then another funny dynamic you'll see whenever you run into people in real life is people will basically whisper to one another. I was just in Miami. Well, we were both just in Miami. Hey, I don't actually get what's going on with Web3. Like we know that it's cool. We know we probably didn't buy as much Bitcoin as we wanted to buy or should have bought in 2012, but we would have thought that Bitcoin was uncool back then. So we don't want to make that mistake again. So we're just going to talk about this. Can you, can you just talk about these moments where there's this new idea that hasn't actually translated into the real world, yet our audiences are frankly trying to still engage with it. Because this is, I think, what Sagar and I are both personally struggling with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Is it just like the understanding or just like, how do you even take the first step? Well, all of it. I mean, mean, here's the thing. A first step would necessitate understanding to a certain degree. Sure. Um, So just how, how, how do you, how do you, how do you just think about this as someone who translates ideas to an audience? Yeah, no, I mean, it's hard. I honestly would argue 95% of people who are in Web3 <laughs> don't know what Web3 is uh, because every, like right now, you know, they're building the community, the world, they're building the train when the train's like running down the tracks. So you're like putting the wheels on and the thing's still rolling as fast as it can go. And they're like trying to build up as, as it's going. So uh, the space is just moving so quickly right now. And there's so much innovation and there's so much uh, creation that it's really hard to keep up with. So I think like if you're just like what is web three it's sort of like um taking all these concepts that we have in web two so how you have ownership in an organization right like you are an employee for an organization in web three you wouldn't you would be sort of an employee but you'd also have a stake in that company so you would benefit if that company did well versus now um most people like if you're a barista at starbucks like you don't really benefit if starbucks stock goes up you just work there. Um, but if you were a barista at the Starbucks DAO, you would have token ownership in that DAO and you would be able to benefit if Starbucks did a good job. You would, And you'd also, depending on the amount of tokens that you owned and tokens representing ownership in, in Starbucks here, um, you could decide like, oh, Starbucks isn't going to release pumpkin spice lattes this year. Uh, you could vote on that. And, and everything is voted on by this collective community. And the community can sometimes pull together their money. So if you think of like, uh, maybe I'm trying to think, like if you're going on a road trip with friends, like maybe you'll pull together 50 bucks each and to go get some snacks. It's kind of like that here. So you're going to pull together your money, but instead of going to buy snacks for your road trip, you're going to go buy like different NFT art pieces that you can own as a collective unit. And so instead of like having the individual be siloed, it's going to be a community. That's kind of like the overarching thesis, but I would say like all this stuff is still being iterated on and and being worked through. I would say like most of this, a lot of it hasn't come to fruition yet, but that's the general idea. Yeah. Let's go back to even more basics. What is web two? Are we living in Web 2? Are we on the cusp of Web 3? And what was Web 1? Yeah, yeah. So Web 2 is kind of like the flat internet hierarchy that we have now where we have the social media engagement where we can like go into sort of like, you know, Zoom, like kind of like this, I would say is is Web 2, like being able to see each other. Web 1 is probably like the very first iteration of internet where you had AOL, where you had like dial up and things like that. Um, But Web 2 is sort of like this, this next level of interaction, that next level of engagement where you do have these online communities, where you do have, um, you know, quote unquote, you're making friends online. We spend way more of our time online than we did in sort of the web one era. And so I guess that's like kind of one barometer that you could use is like theoretically in the web three world, we'll be spending like 99% of our time immersed in an online space. You know, this is interesting because, and once again, this is where we wanted to speak with you because you're doing a great job of highlighting the idea centric part of this, but something I'm wondering about, because I guess Sagar, you and I became internet conscious during the real start of that web two era, AKA we're getting on Facebook. We are designing our MySpace uh, unique things, MySpace top eight reference to those older viewers who remember this, but basically I don't think at the time there needed to be all this like hyper intellectualizing everything. So if you think about, think about the first time you heard about Facebook saga, someone was like, Hey, there's this site and you could have all your friends on it. And unlike MySpace, it's not really gross and weird because it's more straightforward and you can just use it. And I was like, okay, cool. And I signed yeah, up. I was, I, like, was at, cool. I was at debate camp in 2006. <laughs> it was really cool. I was like, this is awesome. But with web three, and this is where the skepticism comes in. You see a lot of people just like, even, even in your Starbucks Dow story, um, I've seen people like unironically tweet some version of that. I'm sort of like, may- maybe, like, 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 maybe that's a thing. So it's, it's, so what's interesting, it's, it's not even that the train is getting built as it's going down the tracks. It's that there aren't probably even tracks in the first place. And there definitely isn't a destination, but there's a financial incentive 
to describe there being a set of tracks and a destination when it's unclear whether it actually exists. So just I just spewed a lot of things at you, but I think it's just reflecting the fact of them thinking organically here about how confusing this space is. So just how do you think how are you thinking about these dynamics? Yeah, no, I mean that's super fair. And so like with the financial industry, so even just like taking one aspect of this web three space, which is like finance, right? DeFi. Um, finance is sometimes intentionally confusing. They don't really want you to know how to invest, right? And, and so you could argue that the same sort of parameters are maybe being applied to the Web3 space to some degree where it's like, if we get it, sure, we want people and their money, but we don't want them like taking the alpha, quote unquote, uh, of this space. Uh, so I think that- What does that mean? Often, Sorry, can you explain what that means? Taking yeah, the alpha? It, so taking the alpha would be like you're able to benefit from the uh, at least so you're able to benefit from the upside of different projects and you're able to like ride a really big wave. So most of the time in, in finance, like you want a lot of money going towards different projects because that means project go up, right? But you mm-hmm. want to be the one who gets out first, who makes the most returns. And so I do think we're seeing some of that stuff happening in the web three crypto space where it's like, okay, we're going to tell everybody to like go invest in this project rug pull, essentially go tell everybody to go invest in this project. Once everything goes up to a certain price, it does really well. We're going to run away with their money essentially. And so I think that like, there's kind of that general vibe where it's like, what? So you're just like, funneling a bunch of money towards things where it's like, is this actually a thing yet? I don't know. And even with the the metaverse, like kind of circling back to that doesn't exist. Like that's right, not a real yeah. thing yet. And people, if you're a startup and you say I'm a metaverse company, like venture capital, like a bunch of money is going to go towards you. And it's a thing that doesn't even exist. Yeah. And that's the thing I don't, so DeFi, for example. And once again, look, I have crypto, you know, it's one of the best investments I've ever made. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big, uh, big proponent of a lot of financial innovation and all this stuff. But at the same time, you know, I cover politics in the financial industry and like, I know what's going on here. Like whenever I see, um, for DeFi is a good example. I'm like, look, like I support the democratization of finance, but I can very clearly see, you know, how high interest checking accounts and all that stuff, which isn't collateralized and which isn't insured whatsoever and is getting loaned out at a mega high rate. Like I've seen this story before in actual finance. That's why we have um, government regulation on uh, how these people have the amount of assets they're allowed to have relative to what they loan out and leverage and all that. And I have yet to see a convincing response from the people who are in the crypto community um, to that legitimate concern. Like, it's not cool if if thousands of people were to invest and give you their money and you just lose it all one day. Now, it hasn't happened, but, you know, over the, what, th- how many thousands of years have we had? A thousand years, roughly, or, or so, of like the modern finance system, kind of as we know, with the most basic, um, like, denominated currency that's a problem. So like, how are people thinking about that within that, or at least the ones who are good faith when they respond to what I just said? Yeah. I mean, I think (laughs) it's kind of interesting because it is uh, like everything, uh, if you do yield farming, right? Like if you, if you go and stake your tokens and and you can get more yield on your tokens because your tokens are then lent out to other people, it's kind of like, whoa. And there is a big project that um, got a little bit of funding, I think, where it was a under collateralized loans based on your social media following. So your followers could lend you money and it's like, and so crypto is kind of reinventing, I think on accident, uh, all the, all the things about traditional finance, they're going through that same learning curve that you just talked about, like for the past, you know, 1000 years, like how traditional finance has had to learn how X, Y, and Z works. You're kind of seeing that same learning process happen in crypto. Um, And I think that like some of the stuff is truly innovative and they are thinking about like interest rates a little bit differently, but um, a lot of this stuff is, it's kind of like funny for the brain to wrap its head around because a lot of it is just showing how the uh, the concept of money as we know it isn't as real as like maybe it is. It, it's really just collective belief, like driving the value oh, of, of different right. assets. And I think that c- crypto is showing how true that is. Yeah. And in terms of like how the community responds to uh, all the all the reg pulls, FTX, which is one of the crypto exchanges, reduced the margin that they were allowing people to take out, which I think is an important step. Um, 
But yeah, it's wild. It's almost like uh, somebody wrote, Raul Paul wrote a really good thread about this generation and how they think about investing. And it's almost like if you can take out the most leverage ever, it's kind of like, yeah, that's really cool. Like, good for you. That sort of vibe around these younger investors and crypto investors, it's like I'm going to go all in and more and I'm going to post my gains or my losses. Who cares in the end? And so it's kind of that signaling aspect again. You know, I've I've done a bunch of Web3 related conversations on my other podcast, The Deep End. So I don't want this to come off as us just being totally doomer or, or uninterested in the space. We're just trying to have a more nuanced conversation. So before we pivot to our next bit here, Kyla, I would love to hear what excites you about Web3. So I, I doubt that's the Dow Starbucks. Um for me personally, what's exciting about the Web3 conversation, because once again, you hit an important point, the metaverse, Web3, most of crypto, all these are actually conversations. Most of these things beyond speculation haven't really become tangible things that people could actually use. It's really helpful that we're having a conversation on what the internet should be. My favorite Web3 conversations are, hey, you don't like how Facebook owns all your data, or you don't like how you don't have like any equity, despite the and you don't work at a tech company. So what if we could redesign the internet in a way that better aligns with people's actual desires? That's what I'm personally excited about. I could know that that's a intro conversation that isn't, you can't take what I just said and do anything with that yet, but just what excites you about it? Yeah. Yeah. And to clarify, I'm very excited about what the, I think all this stuff is really cool, but I do think it's important to like poke holes and stuff. So I'm glad that that we're doing that. And that now I'm talking about this. Um, I think for me, sort of like what you said, like just the ownership aspect is really important because I'm a creator, uh, right? So that's my, how I make my living and I don't own most of my stuff. TikTok does, YouTube does, Substack does. And I think the idea that you're able to distribute content, engage with your audience in a more meaningful way, like that's one of the coolest aspects of it. And I think also sort of this web three world is going to open up opportunity. So you don't have to have the star credentials from like a really, really great school. It's more like you have a living portfolio online of what you've built. And so people are able to just like see you more holistically, I think, even if you're like an anonymous person, it doesn't matter. Um, so I think that's kind of like a cool aspect of it too, is that sort of the internet hierarchy is becoming flattened. And I think that's a really neat thing. And then I think that, like I said, the idea of ownership, owning your content, um, owning the stuff that you put online is just really neat too. Yeah. You know, one thing I'm curious, I don't know if you've seen any of this, how do the big social media companies think about this? Because if I'm YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram, like, yeah, that's cute. Um, but you're not going to do any of that on my platform where you actually, um, you know, like I, for me, yeah, I'm the same way, like who really owns it? Um, like I have the people who pay premium subscriber breaking points credit card information in terms of like my ability to charge them but everything else is built through youtube twitter and instagram like they basically own all of that so let's say like right now sure twitter is going to allow nft sales or whatever why would they not why would they allow that in the future without taking a cut i could easily see something like that happening yeah they will i mean they'll get yeah that. yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah they're gonna build like, themselves around it yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So let's actually, I said we're going to move on, but this is actually the really important part because Kyla, you zoomed in on the important idea of Web3, which is ownership. I've heard a couple people talk about this in the sense of, so for example, three of us are creators. We have audience members who came in early, the people who, so for example, Sagar, people who are breaking points, premium subscribers. Kyle, I see you just turned on Substack subscriptions, even though most of your content, actually all of your content is still free. People right now have the ability to pay and support, but they don't, they can't own any part of that. They can't take equity in the part. They can't actually build a community. What do you think about that idea? I think the one part that makes people skeptical, and I think as Sagar and I have discussed it, make us reluctant to play around that space is it all just feels a little too kind of grift adjacent. So it'd be very easy for us to just be like, hey, breaking points, realignment, NFT, speculation thing, yeah. ownership. Someone actually did tell me to sell an NFT. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so help us. So as someone who's excited about that part of the space, can you convince us that? 
this is something that matters and is something that actual people will do. Um, one last quick example here to make this clear. Um, there's this platform called mirror.xyz where you can, you know, mint, um, articles as, uh, um, you know, with, with Ethereum. And so it's, it's basically medium, but built on web three. But if you look at most people, no one's actually like buying or collecting the pieces, um, even for top tier folks there too. So it doesn't seem like there's audience demand for it right now. So just what's your, what's your reflection on all this? Yeah. So it's kind of funny. I think like it's another thing um, that's great in theory, but weird in practice uh, or not quite tangible yet in practice. So I think one thing that I think a lot about is sort of of a creator cap table. Like it'd be really cool to have investors and creators and like just being able to benefit. Can you explain that? Just are we have, you know, for people who don't even know what a cap table is. Yeah. So a creator cap table would be like you, different people are able to write you a check and be like, okay, I think that I'm going to give you this money, just like your business. Like say I'm like a coffee shop and they're like, Hey, I think that you're going to be a good coffee shop, good creator. And I'm going to invest this with you in the expectation that it goes, that you appreciate and value over time as a creator, as a person that you make money from the platforms that your audience becomes like, maybe you monetize through your audience, maybe you monetize through brands, but it's sort of like investors being able to participate in the upside of uh, creators. And I think that there's a huge room for the audience, kind of like what you're talking about, Marshall, for, for the audience to participate in the upside of creators. Like I've had some people who've been there since I'd like you know, hundred followers on TikTok (laughs) and it would be really cool for them to be able to maybe not own a piece of me, but own a piece of like the Kyla media and whether that's done through NFTs or maybe there's like some sort of DAO. I've seen other creators do that around like Kyla media as a person um, or as a entity, like they could own in the ownership of that. So I think that we're going to see like individual creators become more like businesses and kind of financialize aspects about themselves through that lens. But then the big question does become like, you don't want to grift from your audience. Like I don't, for me, all of my stuff is, is meant to be free forever, hopefully. And I don't ever want anybody. <laughs> nice <to> caveat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the, the goal is like, how can the audience participate a little bit more? And so I think web three, it's still sticky right now, but there's huge applications for your audience to like be invested in you as a, as an entity. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if that answered your question. No, it's helpful. It's helpful to think about, um, Mm -hmm. because like, like Marshall said, it's very difficult, difficult to disaggregate the actually cool concept. And I mean, I look, my own career is, you know, I guess probably on the cusp somewhere around there in terms of like actually directly monetizing audience, owning the direct uh, relationship while also having the presence all across um, major social media platforms. I think of that not as my income stream, but as promotion for my subscription business, if that makes sense, which is probably more directionally where things are headed. Here's where I am curious um, in what you were talking about, which is the learning the lessons and the way that crypto and everybody interacts with government. Because for example, I'm I'm really of two minds. Like for all of the skepticism I expressed around DeFi, I also literally do not trust the treasury department or our like boomer Senate to regulate it properly. Um, and like, you know, this is probably my most libertarian instinct, but I'm like, yeah, like maybe we should let that flower a little bit more and we can, you know, like see how it shakes out before we step in. This comes as the Biden administration right now considering regulating stablecoin. And look, like as we have seen, I think there's some danger in it. I also think it's a very cool concept um, in terms of how you can democratize what rich people literally already do um, mm-hmm. by interacting with the banking system. So how are people thinking about that? How do you think about that, first of all? Um, and then maybe give us a reflection of how other people in space are thinking about it too. And can you explain what stablecoin is too? Oh yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's so many layers to this cake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's sort of funny, like your last point around, like how rich people already kind of like. Yeah, they do this- all of this. I, I hope people well, know that. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Ackman like was like, hey, Fed, I think that you should raise rates. And then he's like, I have a hedge on that would like right. literally help. I would benefit monetarily, like if, if if rates are raised. Um, so it, yeah, this stuff is already happening. Um, I think that, so 
the they've taken such a long time to regulate crypto like i'm i'm just been like whoa and this comes in the in the backdrop of them being like will we default on the debt or won't we like it's just like oh my gosh like how can it how can this be a functioning government if they can't even figure out if they're not going to default on the debt and they just keep on kicking that can down the road. And so now they came out with the stablecoin report. So stablecoins are essentially like the backstop of the crypto world. So like, that's how you get your money out of crypto into USC is through like the stablecoin thing. Um, and it's kind of like the stable esque of it. So it stabilizes the ecosystem. Um, and so the, uh, the SEC or one of the government bodies came out with a report yesterday that was like, oh, you know, we think that stable coins are going to revolutionize the world of payments. We think that there's huge application for them, but they're also like, we think that they should be issued through like essentially like government institutions probably. But we also recognize that there's going to be big corporations that are playing in the stable coin game. Like I think they listed Visa and PayPal and a couple of other companies. Um, and so the whole thing was like, are they going to crack down on stable coins? Because that could be really, really bad if they did that. Like that would be very, very detrimental to the entire crypto ecosystem. And then also the Federal Reserve has this idea of central, uh, so the Federal Reserve is like right. the monetary policy unit of the government. And they have this idea around central bank digital currencies. And so if the Fed is like, everything has to be issued in a CBDC, and that potentially could be like the stable coin backstopping everything, um, that would be really interesting to see how the crypto ecosystem responds like does it get out of the united states um or is regulation going to be built around the existing system yeah here's a quick thing on this we what's what's interesting that i'm trying to figure out is talk to our dc audience kyla and advise them how they should think about regulating these spaces because you said they a little bit ago and what's interesting here is if the biden administration had its way there wouldn't be a debt ceiling issue Congress is where the debt ceiling issue happens. The SEC is a set. So there's all these different institutions, all these different players. It's actually like a total cluster F. So just how should we think about regulate? Because and oftentimes you see, you know, people in crypto not quite understand those dynamics as well, too. So can you just speak about how both sides? So how should the regulators see this space and how should those who are afraid of unfair regulation thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's like a ton of moving dynamics within the within the regulatory body. Like the SEC is like investor protection. We're just going to do everything that we can to make sure investors are protected. And then back to our like original conversation around these big rug pulls or people like losing a lot of money because there's a bunch of scammers in the ecosystem. Like the SEC probably has a role to play there. Like they have to make sure that people who are investing in this ecosystem um, can can play the game and can play ultimately fairly. And then from a like transaction aspect, like the federal government probably should have a say in like different types of transactions and different types of currencies that are happening within U.S. soil. Um, so I think like from a regulatory perspective, I think regulators, what the SEC has done, so kind of like or this idea of investor protection is they sue companies to figure out what they're supposed to do. And I think from a regulatory perspective, that makes the most sense. Like it's probably not the most efficient way, but if they sue a company and they're like, hey, give us all your documents, tell us exactly what you do, they're going to figure it out a lot faster than if they had to go and do the research themselves. Um, but I think there's a lot more synergies between the two things than people realize. And I know that a lot of the crypto companies are starting to develop lobbying units and that will help because part of the problem, and we saw this with the infrastructure bill where they put in a pass through just saying like, oh, we're going to um, tax everybody into the crypto space like a broker, which would be very, very detrimental. Um, we saw that there was just a huge gap in understanding. Can I pause you there? Why would it be detrimental? So as I understand, I agree with the end result, but I'm saying, can you explain why it would be detrimental to tax crypto companies like brokers the way that stock brokers, for example, are taxed? It, it would just be like not good for the business model. It'd be monetarily painful. And then I think from a compliance and a reporting purpose, it would be just like they don't even have the documents necessary mm, okay. to, <laughs> to, to report like that, I'm pretty sure. Um, and th that, it, yeah, it would just be really not good. And so we saw that happen with the infrastructure bill, where it was very clear that politicians didn't understand the crypto space, and yet they're making regulation around it. So I think there's just a lot of room for crypto people to be like, hey, this is how the, in this, this is what they're doing. Like Coin Center does a really good job at this. Like, um, this is how it works. And then I think politicians need to 
realize that, you know, um, their staffers who write, you know, two page papers about whatever this is, they really need to have more boots on the ground experience with some of these crypto people and crypto people probably need to be in the room. And I think the stablecoin report kind of talked about that, like that, that synergy there, but there just has to be a lot more cross collaboration. You know, something I'm wondering about is, and this is where we have to play devil's advocate, this pushback has kind of started on social media. If we were, if we took crypto and replaced it with finance, a lot of people who are cheering for crypto lobbying, pushing back against the government would be kind of ticked off. So like in the sense of, so when we're saying get crypto people in the room, if you say get Wall Street in the room, people in this audience wouldn't like that. What's important though, when you hit this earlier is the fact that Wall Street is something that's understood. So it's not it's not this it's not as if this is Wall Street in like 1910. This isn't Wall Street in 1935. This is Wall Street in 2020, 2021. That's a different dynamic, but just to help us think through this space, but let's just pretend Sagar and I are completely just DC establishment whatever. At what point should we at, at what point does getting someone in the room constitute something good? versus something bad. So for example, when A16Z was lobbying around the hill a past few weeks ago, people were sort of saying like, hey, wait, wait a second, like they're lobbying for a space that they're heavily invested in. So obviously they're gonna say this, this, and that. And when they recommend a framework for regulating that space, they're going to support it. Now, plenty of people, myself included, because frankly I'm pro-crypto and pro-web3, I think that's awesome, but I have to be fair and acknowledge that if you replaced that context with Wall Street post-2008 financial crisis, I wouldn't like that part. So where does this weird transition point happen within an industry, do you think? Mm. No, that's super fair. And I think that they're the... People who are lobbying, um, I don't know if their bags should be as heavy as A16Zs are. Uh, A16Z is is putting a lot of pressure into the space and a lot of money into the space. And so I think like more nonprofit lobbying might make a little bit more sense. But I think it's just good in general, like that people are, that they're going there, they're saying, hey, like, you know, we need to have like effective policy around this. But I think in terms of like the the layers of of when should regulation flip like crypto is still so new and like we were talking about it the train is running down the the tracks aren't even like there for the train to run down and so i think it's still so new and it's so it's almost like internet regulation right like um how the government doesn't really understand social media to the degree so they still have to bring in um you know they have them testify but like the leaders of social media companies like suck um or internet companies like google etc and so i think that there's you just have to have those people in conversation with wall street because there's so much interconnecting between the government and the financial institutions like the you know we have the treasury we have the fed there's a little bit more and most of those people spent time on wall street we don't have that right now there's not a lot of uh, politicians who you know worked at uh you know, FTX or Coinbase, there's a still really big gap in understanding. So I think that lid is not flipped yet. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, let's talk about inflation. So I see a religious commitment by people in crypto to the M2 money supply um, graphs that no offense to them, but they don't actually understand and have just been told um, contributes to the price of Bitcoin and um, all of that. Jack famously, um, if you're listening, tweeting hyperinflation is here, um, setting off a craze of debate. What is your view of um, both the reality of inflation, uh, an area of where I'm probably most villainized on the internet for talking about, um, but also its relationship to all the industries that we just talked to, whether narrative or reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, inflation is something I've, I've written a lot about. And I, I wrote about Jack's tweet in my most recent piece. Mm. And just like, come on, like, you know, this is not a hyperinflationary <laughs> environment. Um, it's almost insulting, I think, to people that do live in a hyperinflationary environment. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah, yes. I yeah. Mean, it was, it was um, and I had a lot, I tweeted about it and I had a lot of people yeah. who were like, yeah, like I grew up in, in, in like hyperinflationary Russia, hyperinflationary Argentina. That guy, like, oh, whatever. Um, but yeah. So no, I think, it's a, like, that's not, that's not whatever. That's it's actually, true. it's actually, yeah. 
yeah, like <laughs> and, and Kyla, if, if there's a piece I could recommend that listeners check out, it's your piece on hyperinflation because <laughs> what you do such a great job of is, hey guys, like hyperinflation is like an like, for a perfect example. Unlike our metaverse conversation, this is like a real thing that there are numbers attached to, there are histories, there are stories. So like those examples are really important, actually. <laughs> Yeah. And like, I mean, in the piece I talked about Weimar Germany, which is one of the most yeah. famous historical examples of hyperinflation. And the government was like, you that you had barrels, barrels of money because people, the government was just printing money in order to finance a war. Um, and we just don't have that environment now. Like, yes, the M2 money supply has gone up because we're on the other side of a pandemic. But when you look at like some other metrics and velocity is, is one that people like to cite a lot. Um, in velocity of money, just being like, how much does the money change hands? Uh, in, in velocity of money is still relatively low. So is that is that to understand this properly? It's basically, are people spending or are they saving? Is that a good way of thinking about it? Yeah. And then it's, yeah, sort of. Um, it's Close kind enough. of like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, yeah. no, 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 go ahead. I, I just, yeah, I, I just, it's funny because we all have to become intro econ students around <laughs> concepts which like literally do not matter whenever it comes to what we're actually talking about as to why prices have gone up. So please continue. Yeah. 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 And so like with inflation, so velocity of money, like that's something people point to. They're like, hey, inflation's not here. But like there is definitely momentary inflation because of the supply chains. Like there's, there's, price pressure because right. we have huge demand right now from people like I want everything because it's not only the other side of the pandemic almost, but it's also like holiday time. And so people are like, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy. And there's also a huge savings glut because of the pandemic. So people were sitting at home, they were saving money, and now they're going to go put that money to work. And if you look at the Fed, so the Federal Reserve tracks inflation through the personal consumption expenditure index versus the CPI, the um, consumer price index, which is what most people cite in terms of inflation online. The Fed, who makes decisions around inflation, uses the PCE. I actually don't know like why <laughs> the two things are different. Um, but if you look at the PCE, there's a huge uptick in goods. So people are spending a lot of money on goods versus services. So they're instead of going to like a restaurant, they're still doing that, but they're like buying a lot more clothes, they're buying a lot more electronics. And if people are demanding a certain amount of goods, that's going to put pressure on supply chains. And if supply chains can't deliver, which is the problem right now, that's going to cause prices across the board to increase. So we're experiencing that demand inflation, like the inflation is, or demand pressures are putting um, pressure on prices to, to say the least. And so I think some of that is transient, but you also have to think about the supply chain in general. It's just like, there's a lot of structural cracks starting to show there's an energy crisis. Like there's a lot of things that are just causing a lot of inflationary pressure. I could, could not you speak, agree with them anymore. Yeah, go ahead. Could you speak? <laughs> yeah, no, that we're, yeah, this is basically, uh, this episode is us pushing back against our YouTube comment section frustration. But basically, could you speak to, let's, let's just devil's advocate real quick. And you wrote a bit about this. What degree is heightened government spending, stimulus or otherwise, playing a role in the inflation pressures that people are seeing? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So people got stimulus checks, right? So I, that's going to, that's more money in their hands. But I think that government spending, like it is, there is a lot of fiscal pressure out there, but the, I, I really think it's like kind of this demand side and the supply chain pressures. It, like the government is spending a certain amount of money, like trying to get us out of the other side of the pandemic, but it's also the consumer, like the consumer spending is, is such a big driver of a lot of this. Um, and I think that, yeah, I would say like that is probably one of the primary things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I can go on this for a long time. Uh, in terms of stimulus checks hit when? March, I think it hit the bank account. So miraculously, people just held $1,200 and then decided to spend it six months later. Hmm, that doesn't sound like most Americans. Yeah, or people have been inside for two years with uh, very, you know, like uh, very different consumption habits and are buying a ton of stuff online. Uh, yeah. Here's where I'm curious around why is this so badly received on the internet? Um, I, I, I'm, so I, I've talked about many controversial things a lot. I am probably have never seen the level of organic pushback on a non-cultural subject, as in, you know, like in something within the culture war, than on inflation. This is religion to people. Why do you think that is? Because I, I assume you're probably experiencing the same level of pushback that I am by talking about this in the way that you are. Can I interject real quick? Yeah, a key ahead. metric for the audience to understand is 
the only time, I'm not kidding, I have this past year, I have gotten people DMing me about things Sagar has said has been about this. I'm not even yeah, kidding. Yeah. This people like, it, 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 it is it is it is this subject um that people will send angry messages about. So I think it's a useful uh addendum there. Wow. Um yeah, I mean I think there's a lot of anger just in society right now. So I think and not to like say that people who are DMing you are angry, but I think there's just no, like they're angry. They're angry. Yeah, they're they're they're, 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 they're very angry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's kind of like, oh, the government messed up. And the inflationary aspect of this is like we are seeing prices increase around us. And we're like, oh, you know, bread is two times more than it was at the beginning of the pandemic uh, because of supply chain problems, because of outsized consumer demand. Everything right. is like circling back to the demand curve and that supply demand graph, um, I think. That's like what makes the most sense. And then also producers are experiencing higher prices. They have to raise prices for consumers. It's everything on that, like, so that, that chain. Like the government is doing the best that they can. Like, Biden went out to to OPEC and he was like, hey, can you do some more drilling for oil because oil prices are high? And so I the, <laughs> I think sometimes it's probably like not the best take, but I think sometimes people give the government a little bit too much credit yes. for inflation. Um, it's consumers. It's consumers. It's a market economy. And if there's going to be price pressures on producers, they're going to pass it off to you. What like what else are they going to do? The government's not going to come in and save them, right? Um, so I think that people get really angry about this because it's like, oh, you don't see that my prices are increasing. And with the Federal Reserve particularly saying that inflation is transitory, it's like, it doesn't feel transitory. Why would you say that? You're wrong. Um, so it's more of that aspect of it. It's like, everything is happening. Why don't you do something? This is a good point. Um, because, yeah, it's like, you can talk and acknowledge that price increase is a tax, especially on working class people, specifically in the grocery store, which is a disaster. Um but then, you know, people get upset when you're like, yeah, but there's a drought in Brazil. Also, like, you know, I'm very mad at um, the U.S. government for spending uh, all this money, which has somehow caused Spain to have higher inflation than us. And, um, oh, it's interesting. China also has the, you know, higher levels of inflation. That's another part uh, I wanted to talk with you about, which is China, probably the most frustrating area um, that I see, although things are beginning to change. Today, actually, the day we're taping this podcast, Yahoo announced that it's exiting from China. Not that Yahoo is like a huge company anymore, but or, or is not that as relevant as a player in the tech space anymore, but it's still pretty interesting, um, the fact that it happens. How do you think that people within... Um, not just Web3, but like tech generally, are thinking about China. Um, because even if we think about this from the crypto point of view, um, crypto people seem to very conveniently ignore the fact that the CCP you know, not only is anti-Bitcoin or crypto, but wants to explicitly use blockchain technology in order to tighten its hold on the global financial system and payments specifically within China. So how do you think that that the political reality of the CCP is colliding with new tech and more and the entire conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I, I've written about China a couple of different times. I was kind of early to the Evergrande story. Like it was sort of before major mm -hmm. news outlets were covering it. And like just the stuff there where I was going on like different websites, like just really digging around and sort of the discourse there was just so fascinating. It was like, China will decide if this company lives or fails. Like the okay, government. I'm gonna, going. Kyla, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to do it. Evergrande, give us the explainer. Oh, okay. I, oh man. Okay, so I'll try and hit. This is, this is we, 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 we haven't hit like finance topics as much. Um, so I, I just know, I just know from an audience advocacy perspective that, yeah, don't want to have that come up too much. <laughs> No, yes. Um, so Evergrande and China are, are obviously tied together. So Evergrande is really interesting because it's like this huge real, it's this huge everything company, but primarily a real estate company. And in China, they did, uh, it's like, uh, it's mind boggling how they run the economy because they're like, we're going to build up a bunch of ghost cities. That's going to drive, you know, spending. It's going to drive all this money. It's going to give people jobs. They're going to build, 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 and that's going to help our GDP growth. But these, they're ghost cities. And so that's the issue that ghost cities, meaning nobody lives in those buildings. And so that's the 
issue that Evergrande ran into is they had a bunch of ghost properties. They weren't able to meet their debt because they didn't have any revenue from their ghost properties. They were building out all these different arms. Like they had this, like they have this theme park. They were buying up electric vehicle companies. They were doing everything in order to spur this spending metric, in order to spur this demand metric so they could show outsized returns. Um, but the company isn't able to meet its debt payments. And China came out um, a while ago and they were like, if you're an over, I'm summarizing, paraphrasing, but like if you're an over leveraged company, if you have a lot of debt, stop it. That's bad. We don't want to deal with companies that have a lot of debt. It's bad. And Evergrande is hugely leveraged. And so one of the theories about why Evergrande is sort of going through it is because China wants to use Evergrande, this very debt bloated company, as an example to all the other companies in China. Hey, see what happens if you don't listen to the CCP. It's, it's just like, or the Chinese government. Like It's just really interesting to see how internally it's kind of run and, and how they think about not only, you know, China growing and, and sort of encouraging this like almost false spending, this false growth, but also um, how they interact with companies and potentially use them as examples. Yeah. So, something that's interesting that hits at the intersection of finance and tech has been, you know, the CCP has obviously done a lot of crackdowns, not merely on, you know, wealthy tech founders like Jack Ma, but actual like tech companies themselves. This, this happened earlier in the year. How are investors, let's just say in US and Europe broadly, responding to these changing dynamics where th there's clearly this narrative shift away from this early 2000s period where political culture war issues, MBA, everything aside, this is a different discourse in terms of the way the Chinese Communist Party treats Chinese tech companies. How is that impacting the discourse there? Yeah, yeah. I wrote I wrote a piece on this too. Um, a theme. So just like, yeah, I know. Um she's everywhere. But uh yeah, so this is really interesting because Chinese companies are wrapped up in American index funds. So if you have a retirement account, you probably have an index fund, you probably have a target date fund, and you probably have exposure to a Chinese company. And so the big question is like China cracks down on what China wants to crack down on. It was gaming companies, it was for-profit education companies, literally whatever they think doesn't fit, like whatever they want the China, like the future of China to look like, they're going to kick them out. They did it with Tencent. Um, they did it with Tal, an education company, and they're going to keep on doing it. They're going to design the world the way that they want it to look. Um, and it's kind of interesting to think that like, you know, uh, BlackRock, which is one of the biggest, uh, you know, finance companies here in the United States has huge exposure to China and growing. And it's kind of like, oh, you know, is that a good idea for your investor base? And there are good opportunities for investment in China potentially, but it's kind of like also like you're exposing your investors to so much more volatility, to so much more uncertainty because uh, China could crack down at any time on whatever they want. And going back to the blockchain, same thing there, like just pl pull the plug on on the internet, you know, <laughs> if they have that, that power. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. I have watched the discourse shift. I'm glad and I hope you continue to bring awareness on that index funds. It's actually one of the main sources of Chinese economic power and leverage on average Americans because we're talking not about like Wall Street. We're talking about normal people, 401k's, fidelity, like I don't know, it's 80, 70, whatever million people who own these funds and they have no idea. I mean, most people have no idea what's in an index fund. They just buy it because you're supposed to do it. Um with all of that. So I guess my last thing here, Kyla, um, which is I'm fascinated by why do you think that you have seen a growing interest on TikTok amongst people your age and who are younger in this space? Uh, the first time that I was exposed to it really was GameStop, which remains the single most popular thing non-politically I have ever talked about. Um, I got more recognized on GameStop than probably anything I've ever else done in my life. And I still don't really know why. Um, clearly, you are exposing yourself to a wide swath of younger people who are hyper interested in finance, but not in the way that like, oh, I'm going to uh, UPenn, and then I'm gonna go you know, become an intro analyst at Goldman, and then do my three years and get an MBA and come back and you know make like five million and become a partner. Um, things have changed dramatically, and I think you're very much at the cutting edge of that. Why do you think that that is? Just to ask you to self-reflect a little bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that there's 
a, a lot of dissatisfaction with how the world has worked. So, you know, our parents were essentially able to get houses off, off their salaries. Like there's no promise of us getting a house. Like the, like the whole system feels like it's not designed for us anymore. And so I think there's sort of this internal rebellion against the system. And with the GameStop specifically, that was kind of like the perfect combination of all these things. Like it was anti-establishment. It was bad Wall Street. It was like the regular person getting ahead of these yeah. big, like head honchos. And so I think that there's just this increasing desire for people to kind of take back the narrative. And that's why we're seeing interest in crypto. That's why we're seeing, you know, content creators begin to take off is because it is really about like the everyday person, I think. And that's kind of why we see this dissatisfaction with going that traditional nine to five route, because it's like, why would I do that ever? And then it's like, also like, I want to sort of own my own story. Yeah. Hmm. I'm glad you referenced nine to five because it brings up a tweet that I'm sure we've all seen where someone says, you know, people in web two are, you know, building nine to five people in web three are building 24 seven. Um, it speaks to the vibiness of this. So let's close with this just final question. So the year as Sagar pointed out started with GameStop started with we're transitioning into the Biden administration, fiscal stimulus, et cetera. As we're closing out 2021, what do you think narratively we are moving into when it comes to the finance space? <laughs> it's kind of a dumb answer, but the metaverse, like, I think that we're going to mm. see, like, we're starting to see all these brands start to do NFT, like Disney is doing NFT drops. And so I think that we're going to start seeing brands begin to like stick their hands into the web three crypto space. And that could be like such an inflection point for how crypto responds, for how regulators respond. And then also for like the role that web three could play. So I think there's just going to be a bunch of different um, questions that are going to be answered or even asked in the next few months about that. Yeah. Man, just to, just, to, just to hit that real quick, I think what's so important about what you just said is that the underlying tension there, and you see this in the news media and publishing broadly, is to what degree does technological change upend incumbents and to what degree are they able to modify and figure this out? So for example, I think a large reason there's a lot of beef in the tech industry at the New York Times is that on the one hand, there's like ideological debates, but also like the New York Times is crushing it after they moved off Facebook and did subscriptions. So there's this real tension there. And I think your your question is really good, which is that there's a world entirely where Web3 just supplants Web2 or Zuck just crushes it and it turns out a Web2 company can make a pivot to this era in a way that sometimes doesn't always work. The players in Web 1 were not the players in Web 2. Who knows whether they're the same in Web 3. So that's a that's a great place to end. Kyla, like you said, you and we said you do a lot of things. Please shout out everything people should check out. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> um, so everything gets posted onto Twitter. So just follow me on Twitter at Kyla Scan. I have a YouTube channel. I have a Substack where I post research papers. I have a TikTok where I do daily news updates and then also short summaries about different companies. Um, and then I have a podcast, which is sort of just audio clips of my YouTube, hoping to grow that out to be something different. But those are the the five things. Yeah, Twitter is, awesome. is where you can- Everybody go and subscribe, follow her on Twitter, all of that support her work. Really enjoyed this, Kyla. It's actually incredibly helpful to me. Um, And I hope for everybody. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks.